Welcome. I'm glad to be with you all today. And uh, we'll talk about uh, business to the glory of God. And uh, the way I've arranged today's talk is to tell you a little bit about uh, my journey from college to where I am today and uh, hopefully give you some uh, insights as to how business uh, can indeed be uh, ministry. Uh, that seemed to be like an oxymoron when I was growing up. Uh, didn't really hear that narrative that much, but uh, the Crow School of Business particularly has done a good job of, of really articulating that anything we do uh, in business is service. It should be ministry. It's not less than any other major on campus, and it's not more than. Uh, God's gifted us all in a certain way, and that's what we're supposed to lean into and not be something that we're not. So uh, I wanted to explain, she already introduced me this way, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about what I do here. Uh, most of you probably have heard of the startup competition from the posters and so forth. This is our fourth annual. Um, I'm director of strategic initiatives for the Kroll School of Business which basically means I work with uh, Dean Gary Lindblad on strategizing on how to uh, best utilize the resources of the business school, how to expand it, uh, what things do we need to do uh, in a business school to be innovative. So one of his uh, major initiatives had to do with entrepreneurship innovation. So we launched the startup competition in 2015. So this is our fourth annual. It's open to the entire campus. So it's not a business school function. Uh, it's open to any major, undergrad, grad, and even alumni. Uh, Ten years out, we didn't want our alums to say, you know, hey, I wish that was around when I was here. So if they're 10 years, within that 10-year window, they can also participate. Um, so we're in the midst of team registrations right now. We've had a series of workshops and uh, events. Next Monday night, the teams will be submitted. Uh, it's three people per team and uh, they'll basically register the team, meet the qualifications, and then move forward to do the concept paper. Uh, that's startup competition. Uh, the capstone class, if you hadn't heard about the master management program, uh, another innovative idea by Dr. Lindblad was who's training those that are interested in doing social enterprise work or nonprofit work. Um, if you analyze kind of where those leaders come from, they come from a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, some come from seminary, some come from uh, having had a business career, and then they step into the role of a nonprofit leader. And so the innovative thought was, what if we took Biola's MBA program and cut it back to, 30, to 75%, not the MBA program, but this new degree program, and then take Talbot Seminary and take 25% of Talbot Seminary and create a hybrid degree. That way you give a person basic business fundamentals at a good level, and you also give them theological training, either in spiritual formation or Bible and theology. And that combination would better equip people to serve in nonprofits and social enterprises. Uh, we launched it last fall, had 10 people in the inaugural class. Uh, this fall, another 10 people came in. And then I teach the capstone class, which means once they've gone through all the classes, this is the last uh, class, and it basically tries to integrate everything together. Uh, so that will happen uh, later this month, will be the first capstone class. Praxis Academy, if you haven't heard of it, about 50 Biola students uh, have gone through the program since we started hosting it here three years ago. If you're interested in innovation, entrepreneurship, um, you ought to think about attending the academy. It's a one week intensive in the summertime. Uh, the Crow School of Business has 10 scholarships to offer. Uh, they're $1,000 a piece. So if money's an issue, you could apply for that. And it's a one week intensive on the integration of theology, culture, and entrepreneurship. And then you ought to go to their website, or at least bookmark it, praxislabs.org slash academy. But what you'll find there is uh, people your age that are cause-oriented, they want to do something significant with their life, and you'll be part of a community where there's people all over the country that feel the same way you do. The academy attracts 200 students on here, on campus, so Biola's pleased to be the host, and it represents about 90 universities, so it's a phenomenal uh, networking event and just meeting people that maybe care about the same things you care about. So we'll start advertising for that in the spring. Uh, in November, 
November the uh, 14th, John Hart, who directs the Academy, will be on campus. So we'll be doing a workshop over at the uh, Crow School of Business. You might pop in because he'll be talking a little bit about practice at that time. So my business, uh, I joined Biola about four years ago as the Director of Strategic Initiatives. That came two years after I had finished a doctorate in workplace theology, ethics, and leadership. Uh, prior to that, I'm an entrepreneur, and uh, my background was in commercial real estate. Within the real estate sector, I focused on hotels. And then I got into the business like in the late 80s. So that was when the phone rang in your office and somebody answered the phone and um, introduced the company and then they would ring your office and say somebody's on the phone. There was no internet, there was no email. Uh, fax was just starting to be a thing. And everybody was like, this is awesome, faxing. This is like, wow. And then uh, as you go through the 90s, I think it was like 95, 96, I got my first email. It was CompuServe dial-up. And uh, I didn't know, you know, it just seemed like, okay, it's kind of cool, but I didn't think about what it would become. And then the internet, it was kind of like, well, that's interesting. How does that work? I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how an attachment goes with an email to somebody. <laughs> how does that work, right? A 19-page document goes through email. So I'm looking at the internet, and uh, in the brokerage business, you got to know who's buying, selling, trends, that type of thing. And we had done some joint ventures with a, a, a reputable uh, leading hotel magazine, but we were always limited on what we could publish based on advertisers, and we had tons and tons and tons of information. So uh, with the internet, it was kind of like, what a neat platform. It's 24-7. It's not that expensive to get into. We had a really good network. Uh, what if we created a publishing business on the internet? Our audience was global, and so we launched globalhotelnetwork.com in 2000. So that's what I was doing prior to Biola. Uh, based in San Diego, lived there 25 years, moved up here when I started working with Biola. And uh, that business is still in place. I'll get more detailed about that later because it relates well to the topic of business as ministry. Uh, the other uh, item on here, Catalyst for Workplace Ministry. Uh, if you Google the Zahn movement, there's like a one minute clip, I think in YouTube. But in 1974, uh, Billy Graham, John Stott, and other Christian leaders were wanting to put bring together the global uh, Christian community and, and talk about how to work together on world evangelization. And uh, it was a very significant gathering. Uh, Lausanne meets at different times. I think they did 74. I know they did 89, so it's not every year. They just do it at different times. But most of it's been focused on, focused on missions, evangelism, and those type of topics. Uh, in 2019, June in Manila, uh, there will be a Lausanne movement gathering focused on the workplace. And we'll have 750 delegates, 50% uh, will be business people, 25% uh, will be uh, pastors and teachers, and 25% will be ministries, parachurch organizations, that type of thing. 145 countries will be represented. And um, that's coming together right now. So I'm on the convening committee for that. But the significant thing about Lausanne is it speaks to global interest in the marketplace. Um, when I was in school in the 80s, uh, marketplace ministry was not terminology. Um, no, mainly when you thought about business when I was going to school was it was kind of like if you didn't get a call, i.e. missions, uh, crew, uh, navigators, intervarsity, pastor, then you did something else. But you kind of felt like, you know, it was like when I was a kid, you'd have two teams forming, you know, two captains, and you kind of felt like, you know, they always pick the good guys first, right? And then you're kind of like the last person. It's like, and I'll take Bob. That's kind of the way it felt back in the 80s, is uh, if you didn't get a call to some kind of a ministry, you just did something else. Okay, so I don't know if that's the way you feel today, but uh, with Lausanne, they recognize just the significance of the marketplace uh, for ministry. And when I say that, I'm not meaning uh, I'm going to go into business and just kind of like give people tracks. That's not what I'm saying. Or use it kind of as a tactical move. I'm talking about if God's gifted you in numbers, finance, 
go do that and be really good and be really uh, full of integrity with the way you take care of the books. Or if it's marketing, uh, when you market something, be honest uh, what you're marketing and represent Christ in that field. So what you do basically is uh, tell and show. Um, yes, share your faith, but first and foremost, do a good job at your work and build good relationships and be credible uh, because no one's going to listen to you if you know, you're like a lousy worker and uh, even if you say, uh, hey, I can't stay tonight to help on this project because I got a Bible study at my church uh, Wednesday night, it's kind of like you got to think through things in terms of how that communicates uh, to your, uh, the people you work with. So that's Lausanne. So a big picture, marketplace is a, is a global uh, focus these days. I put this up here just to show that after my economics degree at Wheaton, uh, the most logical thing to do after a BA in economics would probably be an MBA if you're gonna be a business person. Uh, for some reason, um, after I finished my undergrad work, I just felt pulled to do more in the area of theological studies and Bible. And so I met with some professors and they said, uh, well, I don't know, maybe you ought to go to seminary. And I'm thinking, seminary, that's for pastors. And they said, yeah, but what you're talking about wanting to learn and so forth, that may be something you might benefit from. So uh, I went to Dallas, I graduated. But what I didn't expect is what happened after I graduated. Um, I never felt called into the pastoral role. So I grew up in an entrepreneurial family, so I went into business. But here's the problem when you go into business after seminary. You got two problems. Your first problem is the Christian community. You say, um, oh, I heard you went to Dallas Seminary. What are you doing? I'm in business. <laughs> it's like silence. Because it's just like, what? Seminary? Business? I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Then the other problem you've got is when you uh, interview with business businesses, um, I was going to go into real estate, so I interviewed with some of the larger real estate brokerage firms. And uh, I was proud. I got my master's degree, and that became problematic. Um, it was kind of like, uh, huh, you got an economics degree, you went to Dallas Seminary. If we hire you, we're going to put a lot of money in you. You could leave. You could go do a church or something. So that's a negative. So you kind of, I didn't expect either one of those things to happen, uh, but I was entrepreneurial, so it didn't matter. I went into business, I got into a smaller real estate firm to begin with, and then started my career. But it did uh, teach me one thing, and that is follow whatever's going on in your heart, and you don't have to apologize for it, you don't have to explain it, because as I've lived my life, I've seen God's hand all throughout life, and it makes more sense looking back than going forward. I knew I needed to go to seminary. I benefited from seminary. Uh, it's helped me all throughout my business career. Um, even with the publishing business, <clears throat> at Dallas you do three years of Greek, two years of Hebrew, so it's highly analytical. And in publishing, that's very highly analytical, so there's very good transfer skills. But follow your heart. That's kind of the big point. And whatever you're feeling inside, now's the time to cultivate it while you're here at Biola. Because once you start moving on, um, it's kind of like uh, a ship. And if it takes a little bit different direction, every time it keeps going, it's going further and further uh, away from what you were thinking. So uh, develop yourself spiritually here at Biola. Uh, if I had had the Bible education with all the classes that you have here, I might not have gone to seminary. But I didn't have all those classes, so I really wanted those. You've got the benefit of getting those here. So really uh, take advantage of that. Uh, develop your character, and character is different than just Bible knowledge. Uh, character is taking the Bible knowledge and, and pretty much uh, making it a part of who you are, uh, which means that you don't uh, want to cheat. If you cheat, it doesn't seem that big of a deal maybe, depending on what it is, but what happens is regardless of if you think it's a big deal or not, it actually is doing something negative to you, which is... Uh, cracking at your character, because most people that collapse, it's not like the big thing, it's the little things that kind of add up, and then all of a sudden, how did I get here? So you want to always cultivate who you are from a character point of view. 
uh, when you make good decisions, you're building your character. When you make bad decisions, you're chipping away at your character. But you're doing one or the other every time you make a decision. So take advantage of that here. And then don't let your major define you. And the reason I'm saying these things now is I'm going to get into my story in a minute. But, um, you know, when you're a junior and you have to declare a major, sometimes it's highly stressful because you think, uh, I don't know, data analytics or personal financing. Per personal finance sounds pretty cool. Um, accounting, marketing, management, and I'm just talking about some of the business school opportunities. Um, don't sweat it. Uh, whatever you think you like, then do that. But that doesn't mean if you're a data analytics major that that's what you're going to do all your life. Um, just kind of uh, plug into the things that you're interested in, pray about it, and then trust God's going to use it uh, in some way, and he, he will. So just don't stress about major if you're doing that. Just uh, certainly get good counsel in terms of how you're gifted and then kind of lean into that. And that also gets a little bit into calling. I didn't know this when I was in my 20s. I always thought calling was something that happened um, kind of on a spiritual level, whether it was a quiet voice speaking to you or some people have talked about a real encounter with God. But I always thought it was something that was um, outside the normal. Now... The way I think God really did things is he embedded calling in each of us in the area of giftedness. So when you understand what your giftedness is, what you're good at, what you enjoy, that's a clue as to how he's wired you and how he wants you to serve him. Uh, so don't be something that you're not and uh, pay attention to how you've been uh, gifted. Uh, with respect to the company, um, I told you a little bit about that already. So we'll keep going. Oh, that's actually a different slide. Okay, now we're into the, uh, the uh, focus of the conference, which is uh, the kingdom. I love the movie Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. Um, in the beginning, as you see it, it's a broken world. It's cold, it's evil, it's uh, terrifying in some ways. And if you think about it, that's kind of the world we live in today. Uh, we live in a, a world of brokenness. Uh, in America, there's uh, extreme intensity uh, in terms of political parties, in terms of uh, social issues. Uh, if you go overseas to other countries, uh, could be corruption at the political level. Um, could be all kinds of things, but we live in a broken world. Uh, what happens to some people is they see the brokenness and they say, well, where is God? I mean, with everybody that's starving, I mean, it seems pretty insensitive that God wouldn't take care of their needs. Um, or water, uh, let's say water's not uh, clean in some places, and God gets the blame. But the important thing to think about is God created the world uh, in a beautiful way, but he also gave us free choice. And so when you see what free choice has done, uh, you see the problems, you see the uh, calamity that's globally. And so in my mind, the question is not where's God, but where are you? Uh, what do you care about? What, what breaks your heart? And that's God working through you to address those challenges. So until uh, Aslan uh, comes back, uh, we need to be focused on what we can do to make this place a better place. I've actually wondered uh, what would it be like and I think it'd be totally horrifying, but what would it be like if for one week, uh, all, uh, I'll just make it Christian, all Christian charities stopped just for a week. So that means hospitals, that means orphanages, that means Samaritan's Purse, that means World Vision, that means everybody you know, large and small, it just stopped. And maybe we say not for a week, maybe for a month, if you think the world looks bad now, if you removed the element of Christian love and God's presence through his church um, for a week, a month, I think you would think that this place is a lot uh, scarier. But this is the story of uh, Aslan. This is the story of Jesus and his reign. This is the story of the kingdom. We all know how the story ends. Uh, we know that Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, we know that he's going to be worshipped. Uh, we know that every knee will bow. We know all those things, and we can anticipate that. But until that uh, time, 
when the kingdom is uh, here, uh, we need to be about serving him, loving him, and investing in people. The uh, theme of the conference has to do with picking a, a direction, a way. It really has to do with uh, repentance. And, uh, you know, we all know when we think about repentance on the big scale, it's repenting uh, from being a sinner and putting your faith in Christ and becoming a Christian, being filled with the Holy Spirit, etc. But then there's also the repentance on the small scale. And that is, by small scale, I just mean the daily uh, activity of repentance. Uh, none of us are perfect. It doesn't happen. As soon as Christ enters our heart, we don't automatically become perfect. Uh, it's a struggle, but you want to be faithful about uh, talking with God, communing with God. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's got issues, but you want to totally every day be just pruning yourself and purifying yourself for service. Um, in that way, he can use you uh, in greater ways. Now we're into the the way, and this is my talk as it relates to business. Uh, if you come into the Crow School of Business uh, lobby, you'll see a huge banner that says business as ministry. Uh, that's a very strong statement from the faculty that that's how they view uh, the School of Business. Uh, it's not not ministry, it is ministry, it is service, and they want that message to be um, proclaimed as you come into the lobby and to think about that. One thing you might not have looked at uh, carefully is there's a, a kind of an orange board along the border of one of the walls in the lobby. And very, um, it's hard to read, but there's a kind of a transparency type of uh, words embedded in that wall. And I think there's like 17 attributes of of what the business school would articulate as Christian values in business. So if you have never looked at that, you might look at that. But these are other, th these are other things that we're trying to communicate um, of how we're going to do business. Jesus is the focal point of the kingdom, the importance of repentance in our spiritual growth, and then uh, how Christians are called to make straight the ways of the Lord as kingdom ambassadors. So that's what I'm going to focus on now. And part of this area will... Uh, dovetail into my personal story of uh, business and uh, kind of the way the Lord guided me. Uh, as a quick recap, calling and giftedness, pay attention to how God has designed you, how he's gifted you. If you don't know, ask somebody that knows you well. Say, you know, I don't know. I'm not really sure what I am good at. What do you think? And get some feedback because most people can tell you what uh, pretty well what they think is going on in your heart. Uh, uh, don't think that he will ask you to do something you most dread. Maybe he'll ask you to do something you most enjoy. I remember growing up and thinking about people would say, uh, man, I'll serve God anywhere, but I sure hope he doesn't call me to Africa. And then the next thing you hear is, I'm going to Africa. You know, and it's kind of like you start thinking as a kid, like, wow, if, you, if God knows what you don't want to do, that's what he's going to make you do. And that's kind of like, wow, right? But what if God wants you to do something that you'd actually enjoy, that you'd actually flourish at? Uh, think about that. He may call you to do something hard, but he may not. And so don't think that the hard way is always the way. Uh, until otherwise notified, plug into the area that you think you'd be best at. And then, uh, is one major better than another at Biola? Uh, for example, is biblical ministries better than business? Uh, there's 150 majors to choose from. And I think the fact that there's 150 majors to choose from speaks to diversity and that God wants to use all of us in different ways. So you can't um, think about a major being better than another, a vocation being better than another. Uh, if somebody's called to be a pastor, that is fantastic for that person. They'll do a good job. They should be a good shepherd. They should be a good teacher. They should equip the believers for the work of ministry. And that's what they should do. But if somebody is good at business, then that's what they should do. Um, so, or education, or cinema, media, arts. It's whatever your skill is. So in this community, you know, I don't live among the students, but sometimes I think there can be comparison. And what you want to be is you. Uh, you don't want to be somebody else. You don't want to do a degree just because somebody expects you to do a degree. Uh, you really want to wrestle with God and confirm that that's what you should do. Um, 
I've always tried to follow what God was telling me to do in my heart, and you kind of look dumb sometimes. Like economics, seminary, you know, most people are like, what's up with that? You know, why not economics law school or economics MBA? But that's not what it was for me. And when I decided to do a doctorate, it was DMIN or DBA. Uh, DMIN is Doctor of Ministry, and I focused on leadership, ethics, uh, workplace theology. But I'm going to do a doctorate, so somebody might say, well, wow, if you're going to do that, why don't you do a DBA? That's a Doctor of Business Administration. And it would open up all kinds of opportunities for to teach finance, management, marketing, all that kind of stuff. And I was asked, actually asked that question when I started my doctoral program in 2008. And I uh, thought about it. And then the next time I saw the person that asked me, I said, you know what? I've been thinking about that. And I've concluded that I am a pastor in a businessman suit. In other words, I'm a caring person and I like to interact with people at that level in the context of business, but I'm not a person who would want to do the DBA because I really want more of the uh, seminary uh, studies related to leadership, ethics, et cetera. But again, it's knowing who you are and doing what you think you should do. So business to the glory of God, uh, business for common good and doing business as ministry. Uh, what I wanted to do first is just lay out uh, several scriptures that I think about a lot when it relates to the business. Uh, you might jot them down or you may already know them by heart. Uh, this one here, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that, in your, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Now, that was a, a verse that popped out at me in my uh, late 30s. I had uh, been in San Diego, I uh, was in real estate, uh, I had been president of two different real estate organizations, uh, CCIM, which is a commercial group, and then uh, was part of the group that founded the uh, Commercial Board of Realtors. So everything was good, had two young kids, uh, life's great, and then um, went to a dermatologist and was told that I had a, a malignant melanoma skin cancer. And so I was in Scripps Hospital thinking about, uh, wow, I'm 39 and I got a young family and I've got uh, all this stuff I've done in business and I thought that uh, life was gonna be like super long. And, uh, and the good news was is that it was caught early, so it was taken care of, but the time that I was told and the time that I was told it was okay, uh, maybe there was like a week, week and a half, two weeks that went by. I didn't have to do any of the serious chemo type stuff. But I remember really uh, getting emotionally moved at that time. Uh, standing in church, you know, a lot of times you sing songs about heaven, and it just seems like it's whew, way out there sometime, you know, when I'm 80, 75, but then all of a sudden you're thinking, wow. And then you really focus on time and, and, and life, and it's kind of like, wow, I had so many things I thought I wanted to do. What if I don't get to do them? You know, like, wow. Like, no big deal, I guess. I mean, I'm going to heaven, so that's cool. Uh, but my family, I mean, I really wanted to serve the Lord. And so you're wrestling with all those things. You don't have to have that cancer moment. Uh, you can think about that right now just in your own life of being focused and being about what you should do. But this verse, I was reading uh, the scriptures at Scripps Clinic, and that jumped out at me. I probably read it when I was a kid or read it other times, but it didn't mean that much until I um, had that uh, run in with cancer because then it got me really focused. It was kind of like, yeah, that's it. Stand firm, i.e. don't panic about the medical uh, diagnosis. Let nothing move you, skin cancer. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So I wanted to be about something that was purposeful. Whatever you do, work at it with all your hearts is working for the Lord, not for human masters. I think that's really important too. Uh, you'll find when you're in the workplace, you'll probably be working for people that uh, really will test your patience and uh, test a lot of things about your spiritual life. But if you stay focused on Christ as your master and you got a bad boss, instead of getting all confrontational with the boss, maybe you just kind of think about, pray about how do you function in that uh, environment, if possible. If not, you move on. But uh, just recognize that the boss is Jesus. And the boss is not the boss. 
They are the boss, but you know what I'm saying. Six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. I just put this up here quickly because you'll see this stuff in business. Um, hopefully not in your business, but people you interact with, um, you may see this. And that's why character is so important. And you don't develop it on the fly, you develop it uh, daily. But uh, you will encounter this. Um, I just returned from East Africa on Sunday, and uh, I attended an Africa Hotel Investment Conference. Uh, 600 delegates, including the CEO of Hilton. They see Africa as kind of the new frontier for uh, Discover who you're called to be uh, at Biola hotels, University, a leading Christ-centered uh, university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus African and countries. online. And Subscribe for more of our videos and so learn more at biola.edu. Uh, but when I was there, I also visited with uh, uh, friends of Biola and the Lausanne movement, and uh, my eyes were opened, which was good because I prayed before I went, God, I want you to do two things if you would, um, open my eyes and break my heart. So big idea was just help me to pay attention uh, to what's going on. And I did not know, did not pay attention until this past week of uh, what the impact of corruption does. Uh, uh, power, uh, the kinds of things that business can uh, certainly uh, contribute to. Uh, in terms of money and, and kind of clouding your judgment and making you think more about yourself than others. But, um, you know, when you're observing it in real time, it's kind of like, wow, so this is what business looks like when it's not functioning properly. People suffer, and that's sad. So uh, this here you will see, and you don't want to be part of that. Uh, you want to have a simple philosophy for your life. And this doesn't matter what mage you are. Um, o mortal, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Now that's pretty cool. And that's pretty simple. Uh, but it's, the, the ramifications of doing that are very, very significant. So here's my story. Uh, Biola Startup Competition we launched in 2015. And uh, we're just, like I said, in the fourth annual, the final teams will be submitted uh, Monday night. And if we were gathered today and I said, welcome to the fourth annual Biola Startup Competition, I am really glad that you're interested in potentially participating. Here's the deal. Uh, three prizes, $15,000 first place, 7,500 second place, 5,000 third place. First place team also gets a $10,000 legal package free that helps you set up your business and take care of the legal costs. Uh, the way it works in terms of winning is uh, you submit a team of three. 50% of the team members need to be Biola students. They can be undergrad, grad, or alumni 10 years out. Or if you have a friend from another school, um, that's fine. If they're a believer, they can participate, but 50% of the team is Biola. Okay, so three people, uh, you get the idea. Register your team, the next thing you do is you write a concept paper, three pages. Uh, what's your idea? You don't have to get a lot into the finances, but just kind of like, what's the pain point you're trying to address and talk about your management team and you articulate all that in three pages. We collect those, we distribute them to Christian executives that are tied into Biola. They're read, they're scored, and six teams move forward to the finals. Those six teams will write business plans. They'll be matched with a mentor. The mentor is uh, most likely somebody that's in the field that they're interested in. So if you were doing something in publishing, we would try to match you with a publisher. If you're doing something with cinema, media, arts, we would try to match you with a business person that maybe worked for a, a, a significant firm in Hollywood or in the uh, entertainment industry in LA and so forth. Then, after the business plan's written, we have a pitch competition, and that's when the uh, decisions are made in terms of who's first, second, third. Now, here's the aha moment. The way it's scored in terms of how you're gonna win is 30% is how well you write the business plan, 30% uh, is how well you pitch it, so that's 60%. 20% is a wild card, and that is, thank you, uh, is a wild card, which means the judges can decide on their own whether they think your business can scale, 
whether um, it has a meaningful social cause or a cause or you're solving a problem that they think is uh, important, et cetera. But the 20%, the other 20% has to do with how well do you articulate your faith with the business you're trying to create. And it's not where you write a business plan and at the end of the book, uh, booklet, you put a scripture verse. It's really asking you to think through, you're going to start this business. Why do you think God wants you to start this business? It doesn't have to be a social cause. It could be something that's just a business that's dealing with a problem. But talk about it in terms of your faith, how you're going to treat your employees, how you're going to treat your clients, etc. So that's my pitch. Everybody hears it. I go back home and uh, I'm a thinker as you can tell, so here's what happens. God says, okay, Bob, how are you doing that with globalhotelnetwork.com? Okay, so that's my moment, right? So I'm thinking, huh, well, um, run the business, I believe in, in, in a, a way of integrity, um, et cetera, but there was really nothing that would indicate anything in terms of my website, what I stood for, who I was, unless somebody looked at my LinkedIn profile, they could see my background. But other than that, there really wasn't anything. So I felt kind of challenged in that area. So the last couple months, I worked on uh, redesigning the website, and we created a, a mission page, mission statement page, then we created a core values, and then we also uh, created um, some other things related to the company regarding strategic alliances, et cetera. So mission statement. If you read that on the website, there's nothing in the mission statement that would indicate to you that I'm a believer, that I love Jesus with all my heart, uh, that this business is going to honor God, et cetera. But this mission statement, I just want to articulate, what do we do? Then I wanted to move to the next thing, which is core values. And then I asked the question, well, what do I believe? What do I, what do I stand for? And now this is getting a little bit more out there because now you're going to articulate well, what do you stand for? Now, a lot of these values are biblical values. I won't read them all. You can see some of them already in here, so I think I'll just leave it at that. But uh, I started getting into this thing where words that ended with T-Y, and it's like, oh, yeah, and that one too. Oh, yeah, and that one too. Anyway, it ended up being about 40. Now, you could shrink it if you wanted to and say these are the five key ones, but I went ahead and put all of them, including uh, things like uh, integrity, diversity, equality, generosity, humanity. Uh, these are things I care about personally. And so we deal with, we deal in a global world. I mean, in terms of, we deal on a global basis. So there are people that we would be uh, working with in other places that may not hold to these same values. But I felt like I wanted to express what was important to us. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this was the, uh, attempt to get more personal with the idea that we do our business to the glory of God. And um, it doesn't say Jesus, it says to God, but it's putting out there that I'm accountable to a higher source uh, the way I view the way I do my business. And so this was a result of the startup competition with the mirror turned on me. And by doing this, people that look at the site, they may not say anything, I, mean, I haven't had people call me up and say, hey, that's really cool. Uh, but I didn't care. What I wanted to do is put definition to who I am. And then that could either open a conversation or maybe it doesn't. But they know how I'm going to operate my business. And that's important uh, to me. But that was something that is fairly new. Um, so what's the time? I'm getting into the finals anyway. Six minutes, good. By the way, I always finish on time. I just start talking super fast when I get panicked. So we're going to be fine. You'll get all the content. You might just get a little bit faster at the end. Uh, so in a global business, I wasn't planning to go to East Africa this year, but uh, certain circumstances uh, had me thinking about it. Again, I really pay attention to my heart, and I'll move on that after prayer, uh, even if you can't explain it. And on a human level, going to East Africa, timing-wise, probably wasn't uh, logical, but I definitely felt confirmation that, that was the right thing to do, having gone there. So uh, one of the uh, places I visited uh, was in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and uh, the gentleman took me over to see a business that his wife has, and he said to me, um, 
I've been in the NGO business for 20, 25 years, and I've always been focused on crises, uh, whether it's uh, um, tsunami, uh, you know, uh, famine, you name it. And he said, but it's always been driven by crisis, crises. And he says, then I started thinking about what is, what is people that don't have jobs? That's a crisis. And so this business was all about employing women uh, in Ethiopia to make baskets and different crafts, give them a place to go, give them a place to work, give them a fair wage. I like that. That's doing something uh, positive. So anytime I went and looked at things, it wasn't just giving everybody a high five. It was kind of like, okay, God, what's my teachable moment? And for him, uh, for me, it was kind of like, well, what could I do to maybe help figure out a way to get those baskets distributed? Maybe it's hotel lobbies. I mean, not lobbies, but gift stores. Uh, so I have a lot of thinking to do, but I was impressed with the uh, initiative here. Uh, this here is the uh, uh, tourism minister for Kenya. Uh, at my age, we're now peers. You know, years ago, he would be the older guy, and I might feel a little bit insecure to talk to him, but now it's peers. And so what God tells me about that is I need to steward my influence. I've been in the hotel business for 25 years, um, have good credibility, so... How does God want to use that? But I can do peer-to-peer -peer because of uh, the longevity in the business. Then I went to the Kabira slum and uh, visited a, a charity that was dealing with uh, women that had been impacted by uh, HIV, AIDS, that type of thing. But they, basically the women were in a recovery program, but the idea was to keep them healthy so that they could be the mother to their children. Um, it was the most impactful moment when I uh, went into the uh, place where they were because they greeted me with a, a dance and song, and it was just the sweetest moment. But it was like happiness amidst uh, an environment that's very depressing. Uh, but when I look at the Kabera slum, I thought it was just going to be a bunch of housing, you know, just poor housing type stuff. That's actually like a street for commerce. People are selling and buying uh, goods in this environment. It's the largest slum in Africa. But again, it, it speaks to business, it speaks to uh, economics, it speaks to people trading, and it also speaks to jobs, you know, and how can you improve people's livelihoods. This is where I get upset when it comes to political systems that don't take care of their people, because there's a lot of people that are suffering that if the system was working properly, uh, maybe they wouldn't be. Um, two contrasts. The guy on the left was outside the slum pushing a bunch of uh, containers of water, which I think is a tough job. Um, you're gonna sweat, it's heavy stuff, I'm sure. The other guy is uh, the bellman at the Fairmont Hotel in Nairobi. Uh, one of the takeaways for me as a businessman in the hotel industry was um, if, if all these hotel companies are thinking about adding all these hotels to Africa, that could be possibly a good thing. It's jobs, and it's jobs with uh, maybe some international companies, local companies, but it's going to be paychecks. It's going to be a, probably a good working environment, maybe some kind of benefits. So that was an aha moment because I really hadn't thought about it before. Um, until you see it, it's kind of like, wow, jobs. So how many minutes left? One minute. Okay, how about that? This is the last slide. So. One of my pet peeves is uh, the idea of, of legacy and accountability. And so the thing I want to leave you with, whatever you decide to do, whether it's business or whatever major you're in, um, don't get obsessed about legacy. Uh, people who get older talk a lot about wanting to be remembered and what they did and all that kind of stuff. Um, if that was supposed to be the focus of life, then my, my great-grandfather failed because I have no idea of much about his life other than uh, on my dad's side, he was a boat builder. That's it, boat builder, that's it. Over here um, is accountability, judgment day, being with God. So what I encourage you all to do is just steward the gifts God has given you. Don't think about your legacy and you, but think about God and being faithful to how he has wired you so that when that day comes, I mean, it's a really, uh, uh, moment to think about, but when that day comes, uh, you don't want to look at the ground. You want to be able to look straight out and uh, be pleased with the way that you've uh, done your life, you've communed with him while you were on earth, 
and that you're glad to be there. And uh, hopefully all of us will hear good, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. So thank you for your time today. I wish you all the very best. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.